Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first of our Reconnect webinar series. I'm Alex Andriane Moylan from the Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies at KU Leuven, and I will be moderating this webinar on populism as a constitutional project with Professor Paul Blocker and Dr. Christina Fasano. Paul holds a PhD from the European University Institute and is Associate Professor of Political Sociology at the University of Bologna, and is also affiliated to Charles University in Prague. His research interests focus on the sociology of constitutional law, civic participation and populism, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe. He has edited a number of volumes, such as Constitutional Acceleration in the European Union and Beyond, Sociological Constitutionalism, together with Chris Thornhill, and is author of the book, New Democracies in Crisis, a Comparative Constitutional Study of the Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland, Romania, and Slovakia. Thank you, Paul, for joining us today. Christina holds a PhD in Comparative Public Law from the University of Siena and is Research Fellow at Lewis University in Rome, where she is also Academic Coordinator of the Summer School on Parliamentary Democracy in Europe. Her research focuses on the impacts of the Euro crisis law on national constitutional systems. She co-edited a volume on interparliamentary cooperation in the composite European Constitution along with Nicola Lupo. And among the latest scientific articles is a second youth for the EU Speakers Conference, a critical appraisal of its quasi-constitutional role. Thank you also to you, Christina, for joining us today. Thanks very much. Before we start, allow me to say a few words about the Reconnect project. Uh, Reconnect is a four-year multidisciplinary research project funded by the European Commission under the Horizon 2020 program. It brings together 18 academic partners from across Europe and aims at reconciling Europe with its citizens through democracy and the rule of law. In other words, the goal that we have set ourselves is to explain and provide solutions to the deepening disconnect between the Union and its citizens in the context of recent crises such as the challenges of migration, the economy and security. So I would say that this is an excellent kickoff to our webinar series as the populist wave that we have witnessed across Europe has thrived precisely on this disconnect. So the th thought provoking question our speakers will discuss is whether populism can itself be seen as a competing political force in the definition of constitutional democracy. The general structure of this webinar is as follows. First, Paul will present his paper from for approximately 25 minutes. This will be followed by Christina's comments and a brief response from Paul. During both these presentations, you may send your questions to me via the webinar chat box, indicating if you would like Paul or Christina to reply. After the presentations, I will bring your thoughts and questions into the debate and allow Paul and Christina to respond. So it's my great pleasure now to give the floor to Paul and I very much look forward to his presentation. Paul, you have the floor. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Alex, um, for the introduction and also for hosting me in this kickoff uh, webinar. <clears throat> um, I hope to be uh, what I hope to be a, a, a very crucial topic indeed, uh, that is the um, relationship between populism uh, and constitutionalism. Um, in the 25 minutes I have, I would like to address the following issues. I first would like to say a couple of things about uh, what I uh, understand populism to be. Um, and then secondly, I will relate populism uh, to constitutionalism, uh, and I will try to show how populism uses certain parts of constitutionalism rather than others. Um, thirdly, I would like to say a couple of things about a number of critiques uh, that populists uh, in different contexts uh, tend to raise on liberal constitutionalism, on liberal representative democracy more in general. Um, and I, will, I will, would like to highlight a particular type of critique that I find fascinating, but that, which is 
perhaps also crucial uh, to the populist project, and I tend to label that uh, with the, the, the label of legal resentment. Um, and then at the very end, uh, the, the, the most important question perhaps uh, that needs to be addressed is um, what is the exact democratic promise uh, of populism? Um, so let us start with indeed populism um, as what is often seen as a, a very slippery concept, uh, a very contested concept. Um, in my view, uh, this is clearly the case, but I'm not entirely sure populism is so much more contested than other uh, political concepts out there. Um, I will give you my um, understanding of the phenomenon, or at least uh, I will identify here a number of dimensions that I think are important, perhaps uh, not merely singularly, uh, but in their combination, combination as a uh, an identification of the populist phenomenon. Um, the first one is clearly a widely uh, referred to element, and that is a kind of Schmittian logic of the friend versus the enemy. Uh, the identification of the in and the out group, so to speak. This often takes an anti-establishment uh, dimension. It's often uh, framed by populists as the, the ordinary, the good people versus the corrupt um, um, elites, uh, elites that can be situated, of course, within a specific society, the traditional political classes, for instance, but it can also be uh, and often are elites on the international, on the transnational level. Um, this friend-enemy logic, of course, plays out in different manners and different types of populist projects. Uh, and another uh, dimension would be indeed where it's the people versus the non-people, sort of the othering process that we see in other political phenomena too. Uh, often we nowadays talk about nativism. Uh, we used to more in the past talk about ethno-nationalism. Um, but this is one dimension of populism, and this has to be there, I think, in the uh, populist phenomenon to, to qualify as populism. Um, secondly, there is clearly uh, the sort of the justificatory thrust of populism is a strong promotion of the popular will, uh, popular sovereignty, the trying to regain popular sovereignty against forces that have been trying to take it away, and this is often put in terms of a kind of ordinary man, or ordinary pure people type of context. Um, thirdly, extremely important, I think, is we need to situate populism in the context of liberal democracy. And so it is a kind of, as one scholar recently called, a kind of parasitic force on liberal democracy as such, which means that it, it, it operates within liberal democracy, but it's very critical uh, towards liberal democracy, something that populism, by the way, on the right wing dimension of the political spectrum shares indeed with populism on the more left wing uh, end of the political spectrum. Uh, spectrum. Um, and this also includes that often liberal democracy, particularly in the cases I, I, I will talk more about in today's uh, session uh, in the right wing conservative uh, populist phenomena in, in Central and Eastern Europe. Here we see often the critique that liberalism comes from elsewhere. It's an imposed project. It's something that actually doesn't correspond uh, to our local national culture. Um, and then fourthly, and this is perhaps a more surprising ingredient, I think that populism, perhaps not always, but in many, many instances, relates to some kind of notion of constituent politics. And so populism is as a kind of elective affinity with the whole idea of reforming, changing, and some would say abusing constitutions. And this has a lot to do, I think, with what also Andrew Arato has identified as a kind of indeed affinity with constitutional change because populists claim to engage in epical change of the system. You see this in, indeed in Poland and Hungary. You see this also in cases like, like Italy, where the current government is the, the, the great government of, of change of the Italian system. Um, so this is roughly what, what, what I tend to identify here as populism. Well, how do we re relate 
extend populism further to constitutionalism. I already said there's this constituent dimension there. Um, and often, of course, in our debates, we tend to, and this is particularly so, I think, in, in constitutional law, in, in political science, we tend to see populism as a threat to constitutionalism. It's the negation of liberal constitutional democracy. Um, it tends to take liberal constitutional democracy as uh, deeply flawed, and so populism seems to be its, 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 its other in many ways, its opposite other. Um, populists don't like procedures, they don't like institutions, they don't like intermediary, intermediary bodies most of the times. Um, and they want to create some kind of, or at least they claim so, they want to create a direct relation between the populist ruler uh, and the people. Um, this argument um, is in itself, of course, an interesting argument, but I think it only touches upon, upon a part of the populist relation to uh, liberal constitutional democracy. Um, so the story of populists, particularly populists in government, evidently um, taking on constitutions, abusing constitutions, as David Lando and particularly has argued, is a part of the story. But there are other parts of the story too, where populists um, utilize constitutions in different manners uh, to promote a specific project of their own. Um, and I think this part ought to be um, explored further. That is, we can't simply juxtapose the populist as the bad forces um, to the uh, constitutional order and its promoters as the good order. There's something more going on there, it seems to me. And as you can see on this slide, there's an example of the uh, 2010 uh, constitutional pro project of the Polish Law and Justice Party, in which it lays out this, its view of a so-called fourth republic. What does this mean? What kind of engagement do populists then um, have with constitution making? Is it merely undermining and, and dismantling checks and limits on power? Or is there actually also, in a, in a certain way, a more positive dimension in which they try to build up something, uh, which might be about strengthening their own position within the political landscape, but it might be also reflecting, as it does, I think, in particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, a specific conservative political project. Um, and so populism then, um, in its relation to constitutionalism, in my view, needs to be explored further, also for a number of other reasons. Uh, that is, as I said, populists take on constitutions, they try to remold constitutions uh, with a specific project in mind. That's why, indeed, I, I talk about their constitutional projects. Um, but they do this with using a whole complexity of claims um, in the case of Poland and Hungary in particular, kind of conservative platform from which they criticize liberalism and liberal constitutionalism. So knowing more about this, I think, helps us understanding what is happening in, in the sort of the democratic backsliding uh, instances of these countries. Um, but thirdly, uh, what is equally important, I think, by, by, by analyzing these cases, um, we're not only analyzing uh, those countries where things are rapidly backsliding, but we're also looking into or learning about populist claims that are used elsewhere, sometimes not even by full-blown uh, populist parties. And uh, in this slide, you will find the uh, 2014 political manifesto of the British Conservatives, in which they argue to uh, bring human rights home, etc. There are clear overlaps here with populist views of public law and constitutionalism. What is happening here? Is there a broader change going on, not only in backsliding, clearly backsliding countries, but also elsewhere? Uh, this is an important question. I feel. Um, and fourthly, then, if we really want to um, formulate, design robust forms of remedies and alternatives to uh, what we call backsliding, then I think it's important, it's crucial to understand these particular constitutional projects further. Um, what does 
This then has to do with the paradox of constitutionalism as Neil Walker and Martin Lochman told it uh, uh, 10 years or so ago in a, in, in a book, uh, in a volume. Um, this part of the story is important because we have to remind ourselves that modern constitutionalism is grounded in what I would like to call a dual imaginary. It's not only about the liberal legal tradition of order, uh, of the limitation of power, and what some people have called the negative dimension to constitutionalism. Modern constitutionalism finds one of its main justifications in the other dimension of constitutionalism, which is indeed about popular sovereignty, freedom from external constraint, uh, democratic self -love. These two dimensions have to be taken into account when we look at populism. Um, because populism claims to revive, importantly, the second dimension to modern constitutionalism. And it claims and hence legitimizes its own project by saying uh, we are going to re uh, tap into popular sovereignty as the main legitimatory force of constitutionalism. Um, and we do that because the liberal project has become, has drifted too far away from um, this popular dimension to the modern constitutional democratic system. Um, this needs to be taken into account, I think, when we study, when we try to understand what the populist relation with constitutionalism is. Um, and this brings us then indeed to uh, the populist critique of liberal constitutionalism, which might be more complex than one would uh, expect. Uh, and here I just um, um, identify a number of dimensions, further dimensions could be um, added to this, but the first dimension is of course, um, as I just mentioned, the populists criticize liberal constitutionalism for not allowing the will of the people to come through. And so populism justifies itself, particularly by saying we tap back into popular sovereignty as the main, the central focus of uh, the political system, of the political regime. This relates, of course, to um, its emphasis, populist emphasis on majority rule, what Nadia Urbinati calls extreme majoritarianism. That is, uh, taking back power that has been usurped by minorities, for instance, liberal elites, and put it back into the hands of the ordinary people, the majority. Uh, this ordinary people is then indeed equated uh, um, with uh, the ordinary people. Uh, this becomes one positive political force in the populist story. Of course, this also means that the pluralistic approach in liberal uh, democracy is seen as problematic in populism. Um, a third dimension is then um, an instrumental approach to the law, which means in very simple terms that rather than taking the law and particularly constitutional law as the end of the democratic constitutional system, in populism it becomes only a means to uh, achieve other ends, like indeed uh, uh, the well-being of the majority. Um, and fourthly, then, an intriguing part of the populist story is what I tend to call legal, legal resentment, or you could also call this legal skepticism, a very skeptical view towards the universalistic, liberal understanding of the rule of law. Um, what does this mean? Well, there are at least three dimensions to this. Um, populists tend not to accept the rule of law as a neutral mechanism as a neutral instrument of uh, the liberal democratic system. They claim this, this is always already uh, a politicized part uh, of our uh, political uh, regimes. Secondly, they argue that the locus of sovereignty, uh, as argued by liberalism, situated in the law itself should be shifted away from the law and should be shifted towards indeed uh, the representatives of the people uh, or the people themselves. Um, and thirdly, uh, legal resentment or legal skepticism is very skeptical indeed uh, about any kinds of forms of 
external interference into the domestic matters uh, of de democratic policy making, uh, of law, of human rights. It's very skeptical towards any uh, strong notion of universalism. Um, so, well, how can we uh, further explore this then? Well, indeed, uh, the rule of law uh, is, according to populists, uh, nothing in, in, in the more extreme cases, nothing but a kind of uh, facade behind which uh, uh, political forces rule society. So they criticize the whole idea of the rule of law uh, as actually pertaining to a specific liberal political project. And if we look at um, particularly, let's say, the more philosophical voices that promote populism in countries like Poland, in Hungary, they exactly try to dismantle this neutral myth of the law, and they claim that it's actually about a political program that tries to impose specific understandings of human rights around issues of um, uh, equality, uh, for instance, for homosexuals, about issues about uh, gender relations, etc. And on this slide, you find a particularly uh, clear understanding of uh, populist views of the law, indeed, uh, where indeed the law is seen as not uh, um, a sanctity, but rather it should be used in the name of the interests of the nation, of the common good. Um, so legal resentment is about a critical claim against the rule of law as a kind of neutral mechanism uh, of governing society. Um, the locus of sovereignty is in the, indeed um, in populist projects. I think on both sides of the political spectrum, and so also in left-wing uh, political projects of uh, populist kind, is shifted towards a, a political sovereignty, a regaining of political sovereignty, um, where in certain ways, what is being argued is that liberal constitutional democracy, as we know it, has created too many excessive restrictions and limitations on this uh, popular uh, sovereignty. And so in particular in the uh, conservative right-wing uh, projects uh, that we see, for instance, in Poland and Hungary, the argument is that we need to regain uh, that power, by instance, the re-centralizing power um, in particular institutions and in the partisan politicization of institutions, again, against the liberal elites who have crafted those institutions in these cases uh, in the post-communist societies after 1989. Um, the final dimension and indeed of uh, legal resentment I wanted to, to, to um, shed some light on is indeed uh, this strong claim against any kind of external meddling into domestic legal affairs being it the European Commission, being it the Venice Commission, um, or be it, being it any other uh, international institution. Uh, and the claim, of course, here is that populists say uh, we have the right to self-government, and they use different uh, instruments there from the constitutional toolbox to claim uh, that that right to self-government cannot be violated. Like, indeed, uh, there's now a big discussion, as we know, on constitutional identity uh, in this respect. Um, they also very strongly claim that these foreign institutions or these international institutions often have incomplete and biased knowledge. And so there's a claim towards uh, knowledge to be purely or almost purely local grounded rather than being universalistic. Um, thirdly, they often claim that double standards are being applied, and indeed uh, that in other cases uh, democratic regimes are being able to get away with specifically specific reforms, whereas in the populist cases they are treated wrongly. Um, and finally, um, populist then, and this is the most dramatic part of the story, of course, they question the whole idea of a kind of cosmopolitan universal project in which, for instance, in the European context, we can find one shared understanding of what constitutionalism and the rule of law are about. Um, so the populist constitutional project then 
in many of its instances, including I think in the Polish and Hungarian cases, claims to be retrieving popular will, claims in certain ways even to be saving democracy from technocratic, liberal, uh, foreign-driven uh, political rule. Uh, but in the end, in the end, my argument would be that it fails to live up to its own democratic claims. Um, populism, and here I'm mostly talking about the right-wing conservative version, but we can also see this in certain left-wing examples like those of the uh, Bolivarian constitutions in Latin America. We see populism not promoting democracy, but rather denying democracy by denying pluralism, by denying uh, the pluralism in terms of different political forces being able to meaningfully participate in politics, but also the pluralism of ideas. Um, and also, and this is the most clear-cut example where right-wing conservative populism in particular is not democratizing in simply not promoting actual meaningful citizen engagement with, uh, as what is part of our discussion here, for instance, with uh, the setup and reform of, uh, of constitutions and constitutional norms and rules. Um, and thirdly, um, it clearly tends to undermine, again, both in cases in Central Eastern Europe, for instance, but also in Latin America, it tends to undermine those institutions that uh, allow for um, further democratization of the system, institutions of counter-democracy, um, such as those of civil society, NGOs, the media, and the judiciary. So the final uh, um, uh, uh, conclusion then needs to be that whereas populism taps into this second emancipatory dimension of constitutionalism, at least in the right-wing conservative cases, it tends to not live up to its own promise. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm looking forward uh, to the discussion. Thank you, thank you, Paul, uh, for this for this stimulating uh, presentation. Um, allow me now to ask Christina uh, to perhaps give us her thoughts and, and reflections on 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 this on this interesting presentation presentation. Christina, you have the floor. We can't, we can't hear you, so I think your microphone is muted. Okay. We can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry for the, this technical problem. So it's a real pleasure to uh, be involved in this uh, webinar and discuss uh, uh, this very interesting uh, um, paper, which uh, I think uh, um, shed light also on some common constitutional roots of the populist project that tend to be somewhat neglected. Uh, based on the um, maybe successful narrative of liberal constitutionalism, we tend to forget that there is another um, uh, narrative uh, equally important of uh, uh, what has been named as the democratic imaginary uh, of constitutionalism, mainly based on self-government and self-rule, which might have inspired, at least in part, uh, the uh, populist claims, even though, as Paul Blocker has um, uh, claimed, uh, it, in fact, uh, has departed from this uh, uh, general path uh, when we look at uh, uh, pluralism as uh, uh, elements of counter-democracy that, in fact, are lacking under the uh, constitutional project uh, of populism. Um, 
I think it's also important to discuss uh, in the framework of the ReconNet project, which is meant to reconcile Europe with its citizens to democracy and the rule of law, uh, about uh, the uh, other disconnect that is that uh, populists tend to um, um, highlight uh, as the most important thing, that is to say, to reconnect uh, citizens with an ideal view of what the polity should be and what the people should be, which unfortunately is not at all in line with the idea of liberal democracy and rule of law that the Reconnect project is, that is meant to push. And uh, um, uh, my first comment uh, um, regarding the, the paper um, has to do with the um, description and the uh, consideration of the uh, populist project as constitutional in the first place. Uh, in that, as Paul Blocker um, argues in his paper, it seems that there is a confusing overlapping in the mindset of populists uh, between uh, constitutional higher law and uh, the uh, ordinary law. That is to say that it's not that important after all uh, for a, a populist to have a constitution in place, especially if it's rigid, because then it becomes cumbersome uh, and constraining uh, uh, the will to implement uh, specific reforms. So why to uh, consider it uh, as a constitutional project, uh, as it seems that uh, uh, the constitutional nature of the reforms uh, um, is in fact uh, not that significant. So maybe from a descriptive point of view, but not from a normative account. Um, the the uh, the other point uh, I would like to make uh, um, has to do with the um, uh, special uh, circumstances of the current uh, uh, populist up uprising. As uh, uh, has been uh, um, argued uh, that uh, populist anger tends to be conjunctural and to repeat over time. So what is new in this uh, uh, current uh, uh, populist project that we couldn't see uh, in the past, even in the period between the two world wars where populism was in fact in power. So it's not the first time that uh, uh, populism uh, takes the power. And um, it seems to me that uh, uh, in the particular European context, uh, we have reached a, a level of uh, um, uh, sophistication also so in the way we conceive the rule of law and the limitation to the uh, arbitrariness of public power that uh, uh, is unprecedented and uh, um, this uh, uh, has caused uh, for a strong reaction on the side of course of those who want to destroy this system which is uh, very articulated is complex much more complex than it used to be so I would like to hear, uh, if possible, from Paul, uh, uh, what is uh, uh, new in his view uh, compared to the previous populist account we have witnessed in the past, and whether there is uh, something specific uh, in the uh, European context uh, that uh, uh, is not present in the populist uh, projects uh, elsewhere, in particular because, the, uh, as it is held, towards the conclusion of the paper, uh, the EU supranational governance uh, has been mainly based on integration through law. So legal integration is a cornerstone of the process uh, of construction of the European Union and uh, the, it has reached also a level of uh, um, uh, sophistication in the way the executive power our technocratic governance uh, uh, are, uh, um, are orchestrated, and also the, the way in which uh, uh, I mean, the, the US presented itself uh, as a process of rationalization of the limits of democracy uh, might have played uh, an important role uh, in this regard. At the same time, it seems that uh, the uh, the uh, constitutional appraisal of populism is also able to uh, display some important uh, element that we should uh, take into account, uh, um, being uh, uh, claims that are to some extent grounded in the European landscape, uh, in particular the problem of uh, 
political and democratic responsiveness, um, the problem of uh, uh, the relationship between uh, levels of government in terms of competence, uh, in terms of uh, uh, limitation of the uh, EU powers, um, and uh, uh, the extent to which uh, I mean, the, the process of European integration can uh, um, lead to uh, further integration compared to what we, achieve, we have achieved so far. It seems that there is a, a call here for more politics and a bit less uh, I mean, law, um, which is uh, uh, not a problem highlighted just uh, uh, in Hungary and Poland, but uh, it's quite... Uh, uh, widespread, I would say, um, and uh, with this regard, uh, and with this I would conclude, I would like uh, just to ask uh, Paul if you could clarify uh, what is uh, the relationship between um, its account of populism as a constitutional project and the view uh, of political constitutionalism, which at certain moments, uh, at certain points in the paper, seems to be to some extent linked, uh, so I just want to uh, ask for a, a clarification on this point, if possible. Thank you, Thanks. thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cristina, uh, for these, for these uh, valuable, valuable comments, I think. Uh, Paul, you now have a few minutes to, to reply. I would just like to remind <laughs> our audience uh, that we very much welcome your, your input, your thoughts, your reflections on, on this, I think, very very stimulating, very interesting discussion. So please, please do send us out your, your questions uh, or, or comments, indeed, uh, and I will then feed them into, into this discussion. Paul, you can go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Christina, for these uh, really interesting comments. Maybe I should start off by just saying uh, two words um, on how I got to the issue of populism in relation to constitutionalism. Um, it basically occurred after a couple of years uh, working on civic participation in constitutional reform. Um, and this is important, I think, particularly within the regard of the re Connect pro, uh, project because um, what links um, a sort of thrust towards civic participation and constitutional reform with these uh, with these populist phenomena is exactly a kind of uh, non satisfaction satisfaction with how um, democratic liberal regimes relate to wine society. So this is important. This doesn't render them uh, the same at all, by the way, but uh, that's, a, that's a different matter. Um, coming to the first point that Christina raised on constitutionalism, this is an often um, heard aspect of the story, of course, and I, I, I tend to uh, agree with an argument, as also, for instance, Gabor Holmai has made, that if you take constitutionalism in a purely normative manner, uh, then it's difficult to see how populists are still constitutionalists. Um, I have great difficulties with the normative, what I would call ideology of constitutionalism. Uh, why? Because I think it's, um, it's not, not so much in terms of what it uh, tend to promote in terms of the goods, public goods, such as the rule of law, legality, etc. But it's rather because it seems to me a, a fairly ahistorical account of how constitutions have become core parts of our democratic societies. Um, and hence, I would argue in favor for a more, and I'm using a very um, uh, much uh, criticized term recently now, uh, I would very much be in favor of a pluralistic approach to this constitution. That indeed, uh, it recognizes the different historical trajectories and different historical historical experiences have seen different forms of constitutionalism emerging. Um, Christina already alluded to uh, political constitutionalism, which is both a, a theory, but it's also a reflection of a particular constitutional practice, let's say, for instance, in the case of Great Britain. Um, and so that is the way I argue there's a constitutionalist dimension to populism. 
Um, we might need to fit it into a complex area that is situated between political, communitarian, and perhaps full-blown nationalist, in some cases even authoritarian constitutionalism. Uh, but these are still, I feel, um, relations to constitutions um, that try to build up, uh, as I call it, a constitutional project. It should be, I think, understood as such. Um, getting to the complex question of what is new in current manifestations of populism, well, first of all, I would like to, um, I have a bit of a problem with arguing that the 1930s were displaying forms of populism. I think, at least as uh, if I understood you correctly, Christina, what you refer to is uh, fascism and forms of Nazism, for instance. I would rather follow what uh, Federico Finkelstein has argued, that populism is a cont continuity, continuation of fascism, but in a democratic context. Um, and so that's already new. Populism is playing into some dimensions of fascism, but it, so far, so at least, maybe some people say in Hungary, not anymore, but uh, it, keeps on playing within the democratic game as such. Um, that's an important, important part of the story. Another part of the story that I find surprisingly absent in the whole debate on Hungary and Poland as backsliding countries is that um, both Fidesz and the Law and Justice Party, they didn't fall from the sky. They have to be situated in a complex narrative and a historical traje trajectory of first fascism then communism, and then post-communism, whatever form it has taken. <clears throat> and hence, these particular populist projects of law and justice and Fidesz should be understood in the post-communist landscape, where there are all kinds of forms of continuity with communism in all kinds of different manners, but there's also a a field of political contestation, let's put it like that, uh, which is very much different from that of Western European countries. And this should be taken into account. And hence, the counter-constitutional project, as Kim Scheffler calls it, of Fidesz, and that of the Law and Justice Party, should be understood in the exact institutionalization of liberal democracy in those countries. And if you read it in that way, you see that in both cases, um, both Fidesz and Law and Justice are mobilizing conservative forces that have been there at least since the 70s, that were even part of Solidarność, of, um, of the uh, dissident groupings in Hungary. And so that creates a, a slightly different landscape, uh, which you have to take into account to understand uh, the um, particular articulation of populism in these cases. And that also leads me immediately to the third uh, remark of Christina, which is essential, of course, that is the European integration project, integration through law, a, a very specific project, a very judicialized project. And of course, in the case of Poland and Hungary, this part of the story has, be, has to be related to the enlargement process. Uh, which equally and increasingly now again is being discussed as a very problematic process uh, grounded in a very problematic form of conditionality. Um, and this adds to the complexity of this populist reaction to the post-communist uh, um, Paul, may I suggest, to Paul, may I suggest that we... That we yeah. May I suggest that we that we shift to uh, the discussion with the questions from the audience. We've we've started to have some input uh, from the audience that I think would be interesting at this stage to bring in. I will okay. um, flag a few questions and then perhaps both you and Christina can can respond. First of all, we have uh, Johannes who is asking whether you see any differences between the populism of Berlusconi and Haider uh, of the 90s and, and early 2000s to the current populist governments in Europe? 
Uh, then a second question from Thompson, uh, who asks, what would be your, your response to the suggestion that there should be a state obligation to exclude populist candidates from running for public office, especially when they promise to violate norms of customary international law once they assume public office? And a third question, which I think is very relevant in the context of the Reconnect projects as well, um, is from Matteo, who says, considering the ever-increasing power that European populist parties are gaining and the upcoming elections of the European Parliament, what could be the response or counter-arguments that the EU institutions can put forward to reduce the appeal of populist narratives. And a second question relating to this is the effectiveness of Article 7 of the Treaty on European Union um, and how, how can it be seen uh, in terms of its potential counterproductive uh, effects uh, in terms of strengthening um, support for populist forces. We can start with these questions and then go back to the audience later on. Okay. Um, well, there's a lot of interesting, uh, uh, very interesting questions there. Um, I would like to start with the first one on, on Berlusconi and Haider. Um, I have to say I know the Haider phenomenon somewhat less, but I'm actually uh, in the process of, of finalizing a, a book chapter on constitutional reform under Berlusconi and under uh, Matteo Renzi in Italy and the populist dimensions to those projects. Um, so I would say there are differences clearly, but I also feel that already in, for instance, let's take the Berlusconi constitutional reform of 2004, 2006 roughly, uh, together with the Lega Nord uh, and the Alianza Nazionale, the post-fascists in Italy, so to speak. Um, there are dimensions in that co constitutional reform project that are already hinting at some of the things we see in a much more radical institutional manner being um, um, realized in cases like uh, Orban's Hungary and Kaczynski's Poland. Uh, so a disdain for parliamentary institutions, a strong emphasis on executivism, the idea that the leader the, 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 um, of the government, the prime minister should be directed directly elected by the people, there's a strong thrust towards this uh, sort of politicization through majority sort of uh, legitimacy uh, type of dimension already uh, in that Berlusconi reform. Um, and so in my, in my terminology, the legal resentment, the taking on of a liberal procedural rule of law idea uh, grounded in institutions of legality, etc., uh, that is already being heavily attacked in the Berlusconi reform. And surprisingly, some of those dimensions returned in the central left reform of much more recent years on the Matteo Renzi. And so that's, for, my, for me, that's extremely interesting. I would see more continuity in that sense. And I see a shift in how public law is perceived within society, within um, within political parties, etc. And what is, of course, one of the more important dimensions here is that um, we see this returning in the current yellow-green populist government in Italy, uh, where similar topics are being reproposed once again. Uh, and these topics have popularity. Uh, and that's something to think about deeply, I feel. Um, the other question about excluding populist politicians, I understand the position. Um, I would almost subscribe to it too, particularly in cases where um, human rights violations, let's take again the Italian case, Salvini and the migrants coming uh, through the Mediterranean, um, where human rights are clearly being violated, one would want to take uh, tough legal action. But I would uh, see a form of militant democracy that excludes such politicians from the political landscape to core uh, 
I would have a great um, fear of a backlash, a backfiring effect. Uh, and so I probably wouldn't go all the way because apparently what I would like to call popular legitimacy, or let's say the charisma of winning the elections and having the majority behind you, uh, would make this uh, very problematic in many uh, European cases, I think. Um, and then thirdly, how to reduce the appeal of po the populist narrative? Well, it seems to me pretty self-evident. That is, European Union should move much more drastically away than it has done so far from any kind of austerity program. And it should seriously and systematically address issues of inequality, of uh, the uh, precaritization of employment, the, uh, the ever more uh, widespread marginalization of young people on the job market, that kind of issue. If Europe can take those up in a much more visible and convincing manner than it does so far, the populists have, I would say, very little to contribute uh, to European politics. Christina, do you have anything to, to add? Uh, yes, maybe uh, very quick points uh, uh, on the questions. Um, the first one uh, about uh, populism in the 90s and the current ones. Um, at least in the Italian case, despite uh, I agree with uh, what uh, uh, Paul said uh, about the first uh, elements being posed uh, um, for the populist project at that moment, I think there are uh, nevertheless uh, some uh, crucial differences. Uh, first of all, uh, for what concerns the um, uh, appeal to popular sovereignty, also from the perspective of the tools uh, that can be used to make popular, to, to uh, let popular sovereignty regain the centrality that populists uh, wanted to have. Um, we are currently discussing in Italy about the constitutional reform of referendum, which uh, really endorses a view uh, of, uh, uh, let's say, direct democracy also against the parliament, which was not present at all uh, in the 90s, even in the rhetoric of the time. And also, I think the uh, nationalist uh, narrative is, was not as strong as it is today maybe after the financial crisis, after the immigration crisis, the attitude uh, of the people has also changed. And uh, also the anti-EU narrative was not that present at that time, with a few exceptions, uh, depending on uh, the moment in time we look at the uh, Berlusconi uh, government. Um, so I see now uh, a shift in the role that popular sovereignty is deemed to play in the uh, populist narrative, the nationalist account, and also the Eurosceptic view uh, that uh, populist forces wants to endorse. And I, um, on the second question, I perfectly agree with uh, Paul. That I think that uh, um, um, ruling uh, uh, populist uh, uh, parties or candidates uh, uh, out from uh, electoral Competition could have uh, potentially a boomerang effect uh, um, in terms of uh, gaining consensus for the populist movement instead of liberal values. And on the last question about the European Parliament elections, very quickly, uh, and the potential EU response, I think that uh, um, the EU should try to, uh, although I mean the, the, the time frame is very limited, but uh, should try to uh, provide for uh, tools that allow for a bottom-up uh, um, uh, participation, uh, not certainly in the way that European Citizens' Initiative has worked so far, but for uh, uh, real participatory tools together with the uh, uh, representative tools, so maybe a move could be uh, to announce and to push convincingly uh, um, uh, the idea to uh, promote bottom-up uh, activities, uh, not just the consultation of interested parties before legislation is proposed, but something more structural also on the most contentious issues that are under discussion. I will stop here.
thank you thank you very much uh, also for your contribution Christina I think we have time perhaps um, for one last question um, there's Martin that is asking uh, the challenges that we have in Eastern Europe in Hungary and Poland are not only associated with the heritage of fascism and communism but are also related to the delayed manner in which uh, they achieved independence. Um, and the question is essentially, what impact does this have on the sensitivity that an issue like uh, national sovereignty uh, has in these, in these countries? And does this legitimize in some way the demands that they have towards uh, the European Union? <clears throat> well, that's a, I, I would argue that's a very um, um, a good question, but also a very complex one. Um, it's, it's, it's certainly true that in, in almost all cases in Central and Eastern Europe after 1989, the national sovereignty issue became very, very central. Um, and this only disappeared perhaps under pressure of the enlargement process. And so the whole idea of divided sovereignty in these countries becoming part of the European Union uh, abated that type of language, perhaps. So in certain ways, the, the independence is a kind of return of the repressed. Uh, but having said that, I've always been puzzled by cases in which the opposite can be happening. Like, for instance, in the case of Romania, um, the 1990s were one of very strong nationalism, even anti-Western Europe type of behavior by the political classes, particularly uh, Ion Iliescu in his uh, uh, PCB, the, the uh, Social, Demo Social Democratic Party. And then in the 2000s, increasingly moved away from explicit nationalistic type of behavior and articulation. Um, and so, on the one hand, I feel there is a certain type of um, um, legitimacy in a way to wanting to claim self-government. Um, but on the other hand, in the guises in which Orban, for instance, does that in a kind of greater Hungarian empire type of mode, I think it's hyper-problematic. And it, and it does hard back the dreams of the 1930s and earlier, of course, uh, even before the First World War, when Hungary still had Transylvania, etc. cetera. Um, and so legitimacy, but only to a very, um, a very limited extent, I would say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that is all the time we have for today. I would like to thank our speakers, Professor Paul Blocker and Dr. Christina Fazzone, as well as our audience members, uh, which have contributed with, with excellent questions for taking part in this uh, kickoff to our webinar series. Before leaving you, I would like to announce some future Reconnect activities. The two upcoming Reconnect webinars are planned for the 3rd and 17th of April, with Professors Laurent Pesch, Dimitri Kochinov, and Petra Bard. If you are in the Brussels area, on the 15th of March, we will organize a Reconnect high-level lecture with Professor Vivian Schmidt, entitled Europe's Crisis of Legitimacy, Governing by Rules and Ruling by Numbers in the Eurozone, where she will discuss how the Euro crisis continues to affect the democratic legitimacy of the EU. On the 20th of March, there will be a panel debate on rule of law backsliding, which features, among others, MEP Judith Sargentini. For further information, please vis visit our website at reconnect-europe.eu. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you will join us again next time. From Paul, Christina, and myself, thank you, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.